Hey, Fitzdog Radio listeners, it's me, Gregory Sebastian Fitzsimmons. That was my confirmation name. Parents never gave me a middle name. Don't don't know why. I think I think my parents were a little rushed. I think rushed is a way to describe uh, their parenting. My father was starting his career as a radio broadcaster, and we moved around the country a bit when my me and my brother were like young. And we made it. But anyway, I got no middle name. So for my confirmation, as a good Catholic boy, I picked a saint's name, and I picked St. Sebastian, who was a martyr who was shot full of arrows in Rome and did not renounce his belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet here I am in 2023 saying that I think that Jesus Christ was a good dude, but not the Messiah. Whoa. What? Uh, I don't know. Sometimes I believe he's magic a little bit. But in general, I think we're making kind of a big deal out of one guy. Is there anyone more famous? I guess uh, Muhammad. I guess Muhammad and Jesus are kind of neck and neck as the most influential people in history. Am I missing somebody? Sebastian Maniscalco? I don't know. Eliza Schlesinger? Anyway, uh, I'm very excited. Uh, This Saturday night, I will be shooting my new stand-up special uh, in Austin at the Mothership. And I've been working the shit out of it on the road for the last couple months. As you know, I taped a special back in the spring. There were some technical difficulties, and we had to scrap it, unfortunately. So I'll be doing it now. Uh, my last chance to run it will be Wednesday night in Ventura at a place called Comedy Slice. It is, and I'm not making this up, I wanted to go somewhere kind of special to run it for the last time before I recorded it. And the Comedy Slice is a pizza place where they set up a stage in the parking lot. And the most amazing people come out, and they're comedy fans. And I love going up there. It sounds crazy. And, I mean, I have had – I've done it like four times. And every time something nuts happens because you're outside. And one time there was a pickup truck. It was a bunch of dudes. It's kind of a migrant agriculture worker type area. And these dudes showed up in a pickup truck and they tailgated and they had coolers and they drank and they laughed, but they didn't pay because they weren't technically in the seated area of the show. And then another time we had these teenagers show up. They were not even teenagers. They were like tweens. They were like 12. And they were on their little BMX bicycles and they showed up and they started heckling me. And I fucking annihilated them because I was them. That's what they, that was their tragic mistake. They didn't realize that 40 years ago, 43 years ago, I was them. I was that kid looking for a gathering of people and trying to fuck things up. So I got in their heads. I called them homosexuals. I called them mama's boys. I talked they, while they yelled. I talked over them on the microphone and they got so frustrated. They gave us the finger and they left and the crowd went crazy. So I hope they show up again. I hope they show up in Austin. That would be pretty sweet. I don't know what's going to happen in Austin. I'm, you know, I'm hoping to interact with the crowd a little bit, I think. But I've got an hour and five minutes of material. We'll probably cut it down to 50 minutes for the special. And Adam E. gets helping me out at the mothership a lot. He booked a good feature act. I forget the guy's name. I'll give him a shout out once we do it. And um, yeah, and I'm going to interview Brian Simpson for the podcast while I'm out there. I'm going to do Kill Tony on Monday night while I'm out there. And unfortunately, Joe is out of town. Originally, I was going to do his podcast while I was there, but then he's he's going somewhere. So that's not happening, but it's good. I'll, I'll, it's better to do it once the special comes out in a few months. I'll go back out and do it. Um, what else? Thanksgiving's coming up. We got like 15 people coming to the house. 
We got my mom coming out. We got uh, Tom O'Neill, author of Chaos, will be there. He's there every year, him and my mom. They drink uh, all the wine. We all leave. Here's the deal. If you don't know my Thanksgiving day, it's kind of famous. We start out at around 10 a.m., and we have this soccer game that's like 25 on 25. People wear black and white T-shirts. We play for like two and a half hours. Then every then everybody goes home, eats dinner, and then we meet up at the beach, at Venice Beach, at around 7 o'clock. And in the dark, we all go screaming into the ocean. And you have to ride at least one wave. And then we come out and we go to one family's house, the Dunskys, and they have a hot tub. And everyone brings desserts. And people drink until late, late at night. So I got my niece, Julia, who's living down in San Diego. My cousin, Anthony, is coming up with his wife, Kelsey. And uh, it's going to be a blast. My goddaughters will be there. Um. So that's fun. We went out last night. We've gone out the last four Sundays. Me and Aaron have gone out and done fun shit. And last night was no exception. We went to this really cool place called uh, the Bourbon Room in Hollywood. And we watched the Blues Brothers movie accompanied by a 10-piece band. Brass section, piano, singers, and they, whenever the song would come on in the movie, they would turn down the movie and the band would play in perfect sync with whoever was singing, which was, you know, you forget the Blues Brothers. You forget who's in that fucking movie. It is crazy. I don't know who produced it. Oh, what's his name produced it? Uh, I think he did Animal House also. Um, God, what's his name? Anyway, so Ray Charles. Cab Calloway, who was my best friend's next door neighbor growing up. So I knew Cab Calloway my whole childhood. He used to come over to my buddy's house and have a lot of cocktails, and then he'd sing. And then he sat on his front porch every day, and he did the uh, the, the horse races. He always had the betting sheets out. Uh, great dude. So he he's a, he's a star of the movie in some ways. Uh, Ray Charles, uh, Aretha Franklin, um... Who else? Uh, James Brown. <laughs> um, who else comes out? Well, then the band, of course. Uh, the All Star Blues Brothers band. Who am I forgetting? Um, uh, oh, what's his name? Um, anyway, so All Star lineup. John Candy's in the movie. Carrie Fisher. Twiggy. Uh, and and I, I don't know what the budget is, but I believe it was the biggest budget of any movie ever made when it came out because they crashed hundreds of cars. They shut down uh, whatever that square is in downtown Chicago. Daily Plaza, maybe it's called. And uh, helicopters, boats. is crazy. So it was a great night. People got up and danced. Everybody showed up. I, I dressed like the Blues Brothers. I put on an old uh, uh, sharkskin suit and a thin black tie and a hat. And everybody was dressed up like the Blues Brothers. And, um, yeah, it was awesome. So uh, my guest today, I'll introduce him in a minute, but I just want to talk about he's got this book. It's called Outrageous, Cliff Nesteroff. And... He is a historian, and the book talks about the history of censorship in this country as it relates to entertainment, specifically comedy, and talking about the history of like the John Birch Society and these people that were second cousins, if not first cousins, of the KKK, and they, they created a censorship movement. But then it kind of morphs as you see the liberals start to go after censorship as well. And then you see it, it It goes from being about race to being about Christianity. It wasn't always Christianity. People think that was. That was something that came around in like the 50s or 60s and, uh, and, and got a hold with the moral majority and uh, uh, Jerry Falwell. Um, but, and they talk about music, how they went after jazz originally and then rock and roll 
and then uh, punk, and then rap, and it's it was all the same playbook, the same phrases, the demonizing, it's satanic, and all that stuff. Frank Zappa talks a lot about Zappa and how he stood up very eloquently for free speech. Uh, Ed Asner was kind of a hero. Bob Hope, believe it or not, even though as he got older, he got conservative. We talk about that. Anyway, uh, it's it's just a, it's an amazing book. We'll talk about it in a minute. Uh, we got a message from, we got an overheard that I liked from Nick Heidenreich, who was overheard at a Holiday Inn gas station in Billings, Montana. I was there once, beautiful country. Lady in her mid to upper 70s. Quote, I'm still going to have my yard sale this weekend, though. Context, the weather report for the weekend was a low of 2 degrees, high of 18. So uh, I guess that's how they roll. In Billings, Montana. In L.A.? Shit. If it gets below 65, pack it up. Put the old surfboards and skateboards and moth-eaten wool sweaters. Put them back in the garage. We're not having the sale today. Speaking of sales, the uh, Sunday papers koozies are flying. We kind of got a bigger response than we imagined we would. Everybody wants them. They, You can see them at the fitsdog.com website. It's a pretty cool photo. They're only 10 bucks, including shipping. We do it through uh, Venmo, so you don't pay any fees. 10 bucks, all in, at your door, signed. We've signed them all. In time for the holidays, pick one up for you or your loved ones. Maybe your kids like them. <laughs> so you just go to Venmo and send the money to Gibbons Time, at Gibbons Time, and put your address and we will send it off to you. Uh, you can go to thefitstog.com again to get the details. Um, as I said, we got some dates coming up. We were, we're we'll be in Austin. I don't. I think all the shows are sold out in Austin this weekend. I'm there Friday through Sunday, but you can check San Francisco Punchline November 30th through December 2nd. Fort Worth Hyenas December 15th and 16th. Milwaukee for New Year's Eve, December 29th through the 31st at the Improv. Then I'm at the Den Theater in Chicago, January 13th. Also coming up, Atlanta, Portland, La Jolla, Tampa. Tickets at fitzdog.com. Okay, this episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. BetterHelp is a sponsor that's close to my heart because they got me through a rough time. I did online therapy during the pandemic, and I realized it's a lot easier than in person. You don't have to drive through traffic and, um, I don't know, sit in a waiting room and feel self-conscious or whatever. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of reasons why, but uh, it's helpful to learn positive coping skills, how to set boundaries. It empowers you to be the best version of yourself. So maybe you had trauma. I mean, everybody's got a different reason for therapy, but I don't know anybody that doesn't need it. You will benefit from therapy, and there's not a better way to do it besides uh, besides better help. You can get a therapist. Uh, they give you a brief survey, and then they kind of locate a therapist that's that's perfect for your needs. If you don't like them, no sweat. You switch. You get another one. No charge. Um, it's convenient and flexible, and they, uh, they're licensed therapists. Um, I, I can't recommend them enough. I went in, and I learned a lot about uh, con- uh, CBD, CBD, cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT. Helped me out a lot. So find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash FitzDog today. Get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Fitz dog. Also, hey, you want to go out like me and have a good time seeing live, seeing a live event or a sports or a concert, music, theater. Uh, game time is the way you do it because you freak out. People freak out. Oh, am I buying at the high? Am I am I going to is the ticket price going to go down? It is going to go down. And that's where um, game time lets you take advantage of that. They have last minute deals. All in prices. You can view your seats. You can take a look at what your seat looks like right from the app. The app is amazing. Couple of taps, and you got your tickets downloaded to the app. You don't have to send them somewhere else. You don't have to print them. It's a piece of cake. Uh, they take the guesswork out of buying tickets, and uh, it's a low price guarantee. 
event cancellation protection, job loss protection. How about that? Maybe you want to go see the Stones, then you lose your job. Game time's got your back. You got no problem. So uh, you pick the section you want, and they pick the seats. If you want to do it that way, that's called the zone deal, and you can get a better deal that way. Uh, you're always going to get the best price, game time. Uh, take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Download the game time app, create an account, and use code FITSDOG for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code F-I-T-Z-D-O-G for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last-minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, my guest today, Vice Magazine called him the human encyclopedia of comedy. The LA Magazine said he's the king of comedy lore. The New York Times has deemed his theories provocative, while Vanity Fair calls his work essential. New York Times co- Times called him the premier popular historian of comedy. He used to do Gilbert Godfrey's podcast a lot. He's been on Mark Maron like a half a dozen times. Uh, it was in Judd Apatow's documentary about George Carlin. Uh, he's done it all. Uh, he And he's been on the show before. He's an amazing guest. We had such a great talk. Um, I, I got to have this guy on more often because he's just so, so fucking smart. And easy to talk to. So um, the new book, again, is called Outrageous. He also did a book called The Comedians, which I highly recommend. And another one called We Had a Little Real Estate Problem, which I haven't read yet. But it's about comedy in the uh, indigenous people world. So enough said. Here's my talk with the great Cliff Nesteroff. I don't like it either. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why I do it. Uh, Cliff Nesteroff is my guest. I'll tell you why. Um, during the pandemic, we had to do the Zooms. Yes. And so you just record the Zoom. And then I thought, why not just post this because we've got the video now. And then it just kind of became like, well, now I got a videotape, but I can't go back. You mm. can never go back. Why not? Because people want to look at ugly people. They want to see the clips. Yeah. Well, I understand that. I'm making like a trailer for the show or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But you don't want to see the whole thing. No, I like listening to podcasts. Yeah. I don't know. Like, I'm sure the word podcast is probably in the dictionary now. Right. And I have a feeling that the word video is not included in the definition. It probably says video audio. cast. I mean, who was the first one to go big with the vid? Probably Rogan. Yeah, definitely. I don't think I don't think people watched podcasts before Rogan. No. Now everybody is conforming to his style i guess marin still is audio only is that right yeah yeah i prefer audio only because not all podcasts have video so sometimes you show up looking like a bum and you're like yeah. oh, god damn it you know so. or a gilligan's island t-shirt wearing a, my gilligan's island t-shirt yeah yeah now there's a there's some good looking people doing podcasts now and you really think like you listen and you go this is fucking garbage but well you know what it reminds me of most film podcasts remind me of like Sports channels used to just show the morning radio yeah. guys and the camera would be way up top and it's a dude in sunglasses in a radio studio. And it right. was like, don't really need to look at these guys. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Unshaven, uh, slovenly looking motherfuckers. But. Right. And then who was the uh, who was the sports guy that first broke out? Was it Barstool Sports on video? Oh, as a podcast? Yeah. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Probably. But I, I used to watch like a lot of sports TV, like Jim Rome and stuff yeah. like that. I remember when he had that fight with... Uh, was it uh, Everett that that uh, he was? He kept calling a guy by a figure skater. Oh, name and he goes do it again. The t- yeah, he throws yeah, the table. Yeah, that was awesome. <laughs> that was see. You want that video? Yeah, you taped. want that video? You want that video? So anyway, we're not here to talk about some bullshit. You're a guy who writes books. Yeah. This is your third book. Number three, yeah. Yeah, and uh, they're all great. I love your books. They're, Thank you. You know, they're they're. Jesus Christ, when it comes to comedy, people are so used to the bar being set pretty low, yes. including my own book. Yeah. Oh, wow, come on. Yeah. And so when somebody comes along and they do an academic uh, look at comedy or censorship, as this book is more about than comedy, yeah. um, 
you know, it's really it's it's unexpected and it's very gratifying. It's like it, it, in a very deep level, I just get so engrossed in it because it's so current. The idea of censorship and comedy and whether or not and what I love about this book is that you don't take a side. I mean, right. obviously it comes through where you land, but you don't. But it's not it's presented very much from the side of like, OK, you've got, like we've all seen comedy where we go. This would be better off not seen or heard. Right. <laughs> you know, but then yeah. but then you have the Christian side, uh, not necessarily all Christian, but it sort of morphs in the 60s into yeah. being about race, into being about more family. They love Christians love to say family. Yeah, I, I use the phrase evangelical because it sort of connotates the political element of the right. Christian thing, and not all you know Christian people, especially up to a certain point, as I make clear in the book, were really engaged in politics. You know, right. they went to church and then left everything else out of it, but it became more political because of the evangelical movement and its connection to politics, especially in the late 70s. And that was Falwell? Falwell, yeah. Yeah, this guy Paul Weyrich, who founded uh, The Moral Majority with yeah, Jerry this Falwell. this guy, he is the most powerful influence on culture in the last 50 years. Nobody knows his name. Nobody knows his name to this day in Washington. There's a weekly or monthly thing called the Weyrich Lunch, where lobbyists meet with people that ghostwrite legislation and the politicians who are generally funded. The think funded. tanks. Yeah, and they come up with strategies of how to consolidate power, how to demonize the enemy. And that really was Paul Weyrich's sort of, he was an evil genius. Like, he came up with these strategies, um, like abortion was never really uh, talked about as a political issue until he came along. He said there's a lot of Catholics who voted for JFK and who, you know, support Democrats and they're opposed to abortion. If we can make this our political issue, we could split their party in two, basically have them waging war against each other and, you know, acquire power for ourselves. But Paul Weyrich was really an influential dude who founded a lot of uh, organizations that exist to this day that are very, very powerful. But the roots of it go back to the John Birch Society. Is that where he got kind yeah. of got his start? Yeah. When he I was, was Talk about the John Birch Society for people that don't really know. So I always had heard of the John Birch Society growing up because yeah. it would be made fun of in Mad Magazine. Right, right. Bob Hope would make jokes yeah, about it. Yeah, everybody made jokes about it. Bob Dylan had a song that made fun of them. Uh, uh, George Carlin, when he went solo, George Carlin originally was in a comedy team with Jack Burns, and they did shtick in the early 60s. When Carlin went solo in 64, one of his very first routines, and one of his first routines that wasn't like impressions or just goofy voices and faces, but like that had that Carlin attitude that right. became famous, was a indictment of the John Birch Society as this sort of uh, far-right racist organization very conspiratorial they believed that uh the beatles had been sent to america by the soviet union to destable american youth yeah they believed that um you know they just hated anything that s smelled of beatniks or hippies or rock and roll they were very adamant and everything was sort of cloaked in this idea of conspiracy that martin luther king jr was a a uh, communist agent and that the civil rights movement was going to lead to tyranny in America. Yeah. And they truly believed these things. And they had a lecture circuit and they had their own record label and bookstores, um, uh, a chain of bookstores, a franchise called American Opinion Libraries that were stocked with pamphlets that were all... Pamphlets. Yeah. Yeah. They published a book or they sponsored a book that was published called uh, Communism, Hypnotism, and the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I have to say, you know, coming from, I mean, you, you had jazz, obviously, which was a very explosive, emotional, or, orgiastic expression mm -hmm. in music. And then they went after that. And then rock and roll came along and you saw it go bananas with Elvis and the Beatles. You saw, you could see the parents seeing their daughters shrieking and passing out. And you yeah. go, all right, I... I don't want my daughter doing that. Right. Like you get where this is coming from. Yeah. Well, there was it was such a repressed society yeah. for so long. You weren't allowed to express sexuality. Right. So Elvis wiggling his hips or the Beatles being these cute four young guys, um, all that repression had this outburst where yeah. it was no longer repressed. So it was sort of frightening to people at the time. Right. But 
all that shit seems so dated now when you go back and it's like you'll see references to the Beatles on a on a sitcom they'll be like oh that noise (laughs) that (laughs) racket that's not music you know and it feels so dated so today when i see people going crazy on social media with hysteria like it's the downfall of america if we don't stop this now where does it end it sounds like that to me yeah like the same well that's doomsday prophecy now it's rap and the generation before it was uh punk and before that it was heavy metal and right exactly and, and, and it's just but it tracks that's why you know, my kids don't study. Mm-hmm. They they go to school and they just kind of brush up against the information. They don't retain it because they go, well, we can get everything on Google. Right. But what you can't get is context and you can't get the idea that these are all a formula that's being played out again and again. And it lets you distance yourself from the emotional part of it and go, no, this this is the machinations of censorship, of I hate to say the word fascism, but that's where it ultimately leads. Well, there is lots of that, yeah. And there's different forms of censorship. Like a lot of people like to say that censorship is uh, pushed by one political side over the other. Left wing people say, well, it's the right wingers who right. want to censor us. Right wingers will say, well, it's the left now. And it's neither. It's actually concurrent. Both occur simultaneously throughout history. Yeah. So you have left wing people that want to suppress things that they perceive as bigoted. Sometimes they are bigoted. Sometimes they're just perceived that way. Um, You have people who are religious on the right or on the left who want to suppress things that contradict their sort of dogmatic beliefs, you know, and all of these occur throughout history. It's not like one uh, era is, is, has a lock on censorship. And the other thing is when a person sort of agrees with something, say the suppression of racism, then we don't want to confess that it's censorship. We're right. like, that's right. censorship because yeah. it's bad, but this isn't censorship because mm-hmm. both are censorship, but understanding the motivations for why somebody might feel that way, I think, goes a long way. It's not, um, you know, there's many forms of censorship or suppression of free speech in society that we don't necessarily think of it in those terms. You know, like if somebody spray paints swear words on the side of your house, and you paint over it. Are you a censor? Are you, are yeah. you crippling that person's <laughs> right, free right. expression? Yeah. Most people would side on the, uh, fall on the side of like you know property laws or vandalism laws, which tr- transcend those free expression considerations. So there's many examples of that in law that we have, whether it's slander laws, libel laws, copyright and plagiarism laws. Yeah. In a way, if you're real dogmatic, you could argue that this is somehow the suppression of somebody's free expression. But I think the majority of people would also think it would be rational to prevent those things from happening, being threatened, being harassed. Well, what do you think, I mean, just on a personal level, where do you find the line? Is it the threat of physical violence against a group or an individual? Well, you know, like, America doesn't have what they call, like, hate speech laws, really. But in the early 50s, there was a case in Illinois, and the phrase, it was the same concept as hate speech, but they called it group libel or racial libel. And there was a Klansman distributing literature in Chicago. This is tangential to show business. But he was arrested and charged with um, with slander or libel, something like that. And the ACLU defended him, said, well, no, this is a suppression of his free speech rights. He should be allowed to leaflet racist literature and pamphlets, pro-Klan, pro-Nazi things. That's his uh, right to free expression, it's the First Amendment. Um, but the Illinois state court said, no, uh, the, the, this is uh, uh, group libel, racial slander. So that super transcends or supersedes the free speech considerations. ACLU took his case all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court upheld the ruling that convicted this guy of uh, group slander, racial slander. Um, a lot of people think that that concept of— They of, upheld of, it? That's, that's interesting. Cause they felt so- that there was greater harm to the group from this guy's— was he calling for violence, or was he just depicting racist ideas? Well, both. I mean, it depends how you uh, define calling for violence. I don't know that he was calling for specific acts of violence, right? But he was calling for, you know, the elimination of black people or integration, mm. um, deportation of, right. of black people, and what have you. And that sort of held that precedent held for a couple of decades, and then one of the Supreme Court justices—I don't know if it was Anton Scalia—I think it may have been. Um, ignored that precedent and, and did it. There was a similar case in the 70s. But so there have been different points in history where some laws contradict 
what would be sort of a dogmatic interpretation of free speech. You know, you meet people who say they're free speech absolutists, but you could come up with an example where they would be not an absolutist if somebody was harassing their child, child verbally. pornography. Yeah, any number yeah, of examples. Right. So we all have exceptions right. to this rule. Just none of us wants to call it censorship. Well, and none of, yeah, none of us want to look that deep and hard and dispassionate about it. You know, like when you think about the Founding Fathers and the First Amendment, did they anticipate it would be challenged to the extremes that it is today? Or like you said, was it always like that? I mean, what were they dealing with then? Censorship to them was... What? I mean, what is it that you think made them put that in in the first place? What I mean, they- it's a good question, and it's important to look at what was happening at the exact same time. You know, uh, colonial missionaries made sort of indigenous expression illegal. You know, mm-hmm. Native Americans, song, dance, practice religion, freedom of mobility was completely curtailed. It wasn't considered uh, under First Amendment proje- protections because they weren't considered people. Right. Um, likewise, at one of the constitutional conventions, I think 1778 or 79, show business was briefly made illegal. It's in the one of the constitutional convention uh, platforms. It said public performances are against the law. No, it lasted. It held for like four or five years. Really? Yeah. On what grounds? Uh, that it would breed uh, immorality. That it would corrupt the poor. That it should be something preserved only for the wealthy classes to see a play perform. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So they were contradictory too. We're all contradictory. Yes, you know, and yes. none of us really wants to. Well, uh, and, and also that. it's a it's it it morphs over time. Like you you know you point out that Bob Hope early on was a guy that made fun of the John Birch Society. He's a guy that took a stand against uh, censorship on TV, early TV. And then as he got older, he was one of the guys who was criticizing modern comedy for being too dirty. Yeah, it's, it's you might want to call it the Bill Maher syndrome, where somebody is identified in one certain way earlier in their career. By the end of their career, I don't want to say it's the end of his career, but latter half of his career, he sort of became becomes the character that they used to fight against or would ridicule. And so right. you see this throughout history. I have examples in the book of Mae West, Steve Allen, Billy Wilder, people who got in trouble earlier in their careers with censors who later were advocating for more censorship as they found that Lucille Ball, Lucille Ball. A lot of people just felt that things were getting, I mean, they were getting looser. Censorship did uh, start to crumble in the 1970s Mm. for a variety of different reasons. Um, Steve Allen, before he died, Steve Allen, who was the first host of The Tonight Show and mm. a great comedian. Yeah, the best. And one of the great advocates People for People say the comedians. best host of The Tonight Show. He was time. an incredible wit, really yeah. funny, great sense of humor. He advocated for all comedians. So whether they were cerebral, whether they were Catskill, whatever, he, would, he, he was like a real great audience, knew where the joke was and would laugh loudest in the audience. And Steve Allen was great. But by 1999, and he died in 2000, he wrote a book called Barbarians at the Gate. And he was recruited by an evangelical group run by this guy named Brent Bazell III. And he allowed his image to be used in a series of ads that ran in newspapers all over America that said, Parents, are you tired of television taking your children down a moral sewer? And had a picture of Steve Allen. And in his last book, Barbarians at the Gate, I recommend it just for the sake of fascination. He criticizes the sitcom Just Shoot Me as an example of uh, America being in the toilet uh-huh. and how terrible uh, and a far a field comedy has become. He calls uh, the Farrelly brothers the most disgusting people in Hollywood. Uh, of course, he goes after Howard Stern. He also um, criticizes Dawson's Creek for <laughs> contributing to loose morals. <laughs> And it's just funny to think because often the argument you hear in comedy today is like, especially if you see like YouTube comments, you watch an old comedy clip and they're like, oh, they wouldn't be able to get away with this today. Right. Now everybody's too sensitive. But think about as recently as 2004. Do you not remember Janet Jackson's nipple yeah. and the hysteria that greeted that right. and how long that campaign was waged and they had to pay a half million dollar fine for a nipple that har- hardly any of us it even ended saw? ended her career. Somehow Justin Timberlake survived it and she didn't. Yeah. And now I watch stuff like um, The Righteous Gemstones or uh, Euphoria on HBO. I think one of the first episodes and the first scenes of Euphoria is in a locker room. It's a bunch of dudes' dicks swinging around in like slow motion. Compare that to the hysteria of Janet Jackson. There's no hysteria over that. The amount of vile pornography we have access to 
in our living rooms now compared to 1985 when Jerry Falwell and this guy, Reverend Don Wildman, waged a campaign to have Playboy and Penthouse, Penthouse removed from 7-Eleven stores, which was a successful campaign. Yeah. They did pull those magazines from those stores. There's a lot more freedom of expression in many capacities today as opposed to as recently as 2004, you know, on a podcast, on satellite radio compared to AM and FM radio throughout most of its history. Right. And as a parent, like, I've had to come to terms with that. The fact that both my kids are, they were, they were the first generation mm-hmm. of kids to have phones and to have access to the internet alone in their rooms, right. knowing you know, they are going to find porn. Uh, you right. know, I've got a 12-year-old daughter that's probably being exposed to porn. Like, right. that didn't exist five years before that. No, and even just the mainstreaming of this sort of type of thing, a song like Wet Ass Pussy can be a huge hit, Yeah, not particularly controversial. You compare it to what happened to Two Live Crew in the 80s when Cop they- Killer. Uh, that was Body Count with Ice-T, but the same thing, you know, these records were either pulled from stores. With Two Life Crew, they were actually put on trial and convicted of obscenity. Is that in Florida? Yeah, Florida and in Texas. Uh-huh. And record stores that sold those records, the managers of the stores were arrested mm-hmm. and put on trial for yeah. distributing uh, whatever they called it, obscene material. Yeah. So there's all these uh, drastic differences. I also argue or mention in the introduction to the book that doesn't mean that there aren't new taboos there are especially in the realm of slurs yes there are certain words that are completely taboo today that probably weren't 20 years ago 30 years ago Um, i've been watching reruns of um entourage yeah and they use words like fag and retard in almost every episode and it wasn't controversial at all Um, even the n-word you know when people like it is so completely taboo, but people don't. You can't take people back to twenty years ago when it wasn't. There was a time when it could be said. Mm-hmm. It was. It was never okay to use it right. against somebody. Right. But there was a time where, in an academic discussion, the word could be uttered. Right. 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 If you were talking that doesn't about exist talking anymore. about racism, if you're you, talking about Huck Finn, and you could say the word. Right. 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 And uh, it, it is amazing that uh, so much attention. And I mean, you you kind of you just touched on this for a moment, but I was curious about how the rest of the world sees us and sees our issues that dominate the press. That whether it's Murphy Brown, right, and you know that she was a, a single mother raising a child, and the fact that that was in headlines for six months, and it was in the discourse of every talk show, and then they're dealing with you know poverty and far right extremism, mm-hmm. and you know things that maybe because we're insular, because America is just always, I mean, what I think in a, in a culture that's sort of theocratic where there's a religious component, a strong religious component, that's where the most irrational responses are. So obviously there's countries like Egypt and Saudi Arabia where uh, they're theocracies with this prevailing religion and therefore censorship is very heavy and people get in trouble for very innocuous things. And there's an element of that in the United States. And I think also because uh, religious fundamentalism is by its nature very dogmatic, you know, there's no like wiggle room. This is the way it is. This is the one true God. That starts to get into mainstream thinking as well. I think in that free speech sort of dogma where it's like, oh, there's no exceptions. It's like, but you can point out all these exceptions that occur. One of the theories that you often hear is the slippery slope theory. Okay, you censor this, but where does it end? Next, it's going to be this and this and this and this. And you hear that argument against things like so-called hate speech if i could use that phrase in germany after world war ii after the nuremberg trials they drafted a series of laws to censor nazi imagery denial of the holocaust the flying of a nazi flag even that german gothic typescript that font that you see death metal bands used is against the law there and with Uh death, death metal bands tour in germany they have to change their posters that's not illegal there so If the slippery slope theory is that uh, censoring this, you know, censorship will lead to to fascism or or what have you, uh, that theory didn't apply to Germany. They applied those laws to do the opposite, to prevent the rise of fascism again. And up to this point, it hasn't risen again. So the, the slope didn't slippery over there. 
Um, so even though I do think that slippery slope argument is a valid argument, it does not necessarily mean that it's an absolute argument where it's going to bode be the case in, in every uh, situation. Well, society seemed to self-correct. There's always a pendulum. Like right now, we've swung pretty far, um, you know, or, or, or at least the, uh, the, the evangelical side has swung so far with anti-woke. I mean, the truth is the woke movement has never been more than a bunch of ideas. Mm-hmm. You know, it's never, it's, it's never persecuted. It's never put anybody in jail. It's also just a vague theory. Yes. You know, anything you don't like is woke. You yeah. know, even though it has maybe no relation. It kind of lost all meaning, whatever meaning it may have even had to begin with. Right. You know. Um, and I, I also say to these Christians that are so anti-woke, who is more woke than Jesus Christ? Oh. He, he loved the poor. Controversial. Washed Greg their Simmons. feet. I'm saying it. Fucking George I'm Carlin fucking saying over saying it. <laughs> I mean, it really was. He was the last shall be first, and um, he, was, he was a socialist for sure. When you look at comedy— Making fun of religion, God, Christianity, Jesus was taboo for most of the 20th century. Yeah. It really wasn't until the late 60s that it started to become acceptable. And when you look at the Smothers Brothers controversy, David Steinberg was doing these mock sermons. I mean, the hysteria that greeted him in that show as a result was crazy. Yeah. It was crazy. And you go back, you'll hear, you know, if you read books or watch documentary about how controversial the Smothers Brothers comedy hour was. Then you go and watch some clips, and it's so innocuous that it's almost boring. You're like, why? Yeah. How is this controversial? Right. But the big taboos in comedy for much of the 20th century were politics, religion, and sexuality. Mm-hmm. And those are like three of the most common uh, components to stand up comedy and all forms of comedy today. Somebody like Nikki Glazer would have been in jail if she tried to do the act that she does today during most periods of the 20th century. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it is something that we beat that drum so hard in stand up. Like when you think about comedians that are considered outspoken or edgy or whatever, it really is those three topics just over and over again. You know, you don't like sex is talked about to such an extreme that you think about like, wow, how bad were we repressed for how long that we yeah. need to fucking talk about it to this extreme? Yeah. Not knocking Nikki Glazer. I love Nikki, me but too, like me too. But there's a lot of uh, pushing. There's still a lot of pushing mm-hmm. of, of boundaries. And, um, you know, I don't know what the pushback is because the average person that goes to a stand-up comedy club or watches a Netflix special isn't pushing back at all. Mm-hmm. It's almost like shouting into the void at this point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, if you want to talk about sitcoms or late-night TV— those are completely censored, but always, nobody's watching that anymore. I always find that ironic because in the general scheme of things, college campuses especially are demonized as like being the most anti-free speech these days. But a show like The Tonight Show, which every comedian traditionally has wanted to appear on and has, has most of the same censorship rules that it had when it started yeah. back in 52 or 53. Mm-hmm. You know, you still can't say fuck on Jimmy Fallon's Tonight Show. Why? Nobody knows. Nobody cares. You yeah. can say it on uh, satellite radio, podcasts, cable, streaming, but for some reason, that archaic rule still sits there. And the censorship rules that were imposed on early television were informed by the censorship rules that already existed in radio. Mm-hmm. And the censorship rules that were imposed on radio in the late 20s were the same censorship rules that were imposed in vaudeville. Mm-hmm. So the fact that those certain restrictions still exist on network television are almost 100 years old. <laughs> it's like, crazy. It's insane. <laughs> yeah, it's insane. I know. And I don't know who it's protecting. But my point is that when a comedian does The Tonight Show or any late night show and they work with the segment producer, what does the segment producer do? Well, do this. No, take this out. This won't work. We can't talk about this. Change shit to crap. Don't say fuck. Say this. And what do comedians do? They say, okay. Yeah. They don't go, free speech, motherfucker, you son of a... You know, but if it happens in another context, whether it's... I I don't hear people really complaining about corporate gigs. I always thought of a college gig as like a corporate gig. Yeah. You know, you got to fucking adhere to these rules in order to get paid. Right. It's really not ideal or that enjoyable, especially if you're somebody like me who had so little material 
as soon as you excised some of it, you were like left. Well, with I mean, very at least little. like at least with a corporate gig, you go like, all right, let's all put our cards on the table here. There's a guy who's the human resources person right. who is talking to uh, whatever whoever gets put upon to book this fucking gig for the company, and his his neck is on the line. So there's people sitting there with their wives, coworkers, the the whole like. Um, you know, uh, it, it's almost like the litigious mm-hmm. feeling of a right. corporate environment. Yeah. Like, I get it. All right, so I can't talk about sex, politics, right. religion, can't curse. Okay, but a college campus was the place that Carlin did his special. Sure. That was the place sure. where, you know, you could speak most freely and openly. Right. And how did that turn into the place that it's the most protected? Well, it depends on every single situation. I, I don't know that it's the most protected or the, the, the or that it previously was the least protected, you know. I do think that it's not the ideal environment at all because it is sort of like a corporate gig to me in, in my thinking. You know, I did – the few times that I performed at a, a university, it was UBC in Vancouver. The gig itself was designed poorly. It was called Laughs at Lunch. So you're in a theater yeah, done while people are eating, yeah. and they just come in to kill time. They don't know who you are. Uh-huh. It could go well. It could, they're lit. You can see the audience, mm-hmm. you know? So everything is going against you regardless of rules and censorship. It's just shit to begin with. Well, also, their knowledge base is very limited, too. What, yeah. 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 I mean, this is true of, of most stand-up gigs, you know? I. You have to adjust, as you know, your act for the yeah. audience if you want to succeed. I used to do a place in Toronto. I don't know if you ever performed there. It's long gone. It was only there for a few years. The called... Comedy Nest? No, that's in Montreal. In Toronto, there was a place called the... Um... Jimbo's? Uh, Laugh Resort. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You remember that I place? played there, yeah. So it was in the Holiday Inn, downtown Toronto. And yep. I was used to playing Toronto. Always did fine in Toronto. Great comedy city. Then I would go and do uh, the Laugh Resort at the Holiday Inn. I would always bomb. I didn't realize it was because that everybody that attended was an American tourist oh, from the okay. hotel. So yeah. I'm talking about Mr. Dress Up. Uh-huh. I'm talking about whatever, Maggie yeah. Trudeau. And yeah. it's just fucking, you're dying a, a, a terrible death. Yeah. So, you know, you have to adjust. I'm sure there's a way. But don't you way. think college kids are supposed to be exposed? They're the idea is for four years you were going to be challenged. Well, you're I'm be sure that up some, ideas. some kids are fine and some kids... In any large bureaucracy where you're dealing with hundreds of people or thousands of people, you're going to get uh, conflicting attitudes and opinions. So there's some people that are going to hate on the comedian. There's other people that are going to love the comedian. I don't yeah. think it's like a uniform group thing. Right. But – No, I just mean the functioning of these few voices being able to dictate who gets booked. That's what it's come down to. Right, right. Well, in the late 60s, to give it another historical example, and I don't play college campuses, so I can't really speak to it, but I do know that the people or the political end of things that demonize them the most are not voices that I normally would trust, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, But in the late 60s, Bob Hope was supposed to get an honorary degree at a university, and it was protested and voted down, and then they didn't give it to him. And Bob Hope it was somebody who had so much goodwill towards him yeah. in the 40s and 50s performing for the troops. Yeah. By the late 60s, his advocacy for the Vietnam War made him rejected by young oh, people. Okay. I also think there's a generational component. Yes, Carlin performed there because he was the voice of youth. Yeah. Bob Hope, George Jessel, Martha Ray, they didn't want to see them. Yeah. So when you hear about people like Jerry Seinfeld, who I love, or Chris Rock, who, who I love, and then you realize who is the audience at a college campus that are 18, 19, mm-hmm. 20, 21. These are like elderly men yeah, to them. Yeah. Yeah. Seinfeld right. doesn't look like, but he's almost 65 years old. Mm-hmm. You know? So he's like the age that Bob Hope was yeah. when Hope was being rejected. So I think younger performers have an easier go on a college campus than an older performer. Yeah, they're just more like-minded and more aware of what's in the zeitgeist. That's not to say that there isn't all kinds of censorious horseshit on college campuses. Yeah. But the idea that it is a full-scale crisis, I am very skeptical of that. Yeah, right. All right, so let's get into the book a little bit here. Uh, You got here about 20 minutes early, and I had to apologize because I did not let you in. (laughs) Oh. <laughs> it was uh, it, it's a college midterm i read the book of course like i did in college at the last minute and uh couldn't put it down 
So I finished it this morning, and I wanted to just kind of walk through yeah, for sure. the book and bring up some stuff that, that was the most compelling to me. Um, so early on in showbiz, you, you, you went back and talked about vaudeville mm-hmm. and the, the idea of bl- everybody thinks about blackface as something that you know you saw in minstrel shows. It was not just the white performers, but black performers yeah. also put on the blackface. It was sort of like just de rigueur for anybody that was doing comedy. Yeah, or show business in general. There would be people doing Shakespearean plays in blackface. And I don't mean Othello. I just mean any yeah, Shakespearean yeah. play or Ib- Ibsen or anything. If you were on stage, the same way you'd put on pancake makeup, you know, uh, people would put on blackface. That meant you were an actor. Yeah. You know, and black performers also conformed to that. People who were black would exaggerate the mouth. They would put on the white gloves. Uh-huh. They would do that menstru- menstrual shtick. It yeah. was just considered show business. And prior to the Civil War, there were racist blackface minstrel acts. There were also blackface minstrel acts that would do performances in which they advocated for the abolishment of slavery. Where did Amos and Andy fall into that? Amos and Andy came much later. They came in the 20s. But they were influenced by the minstrel show that was still popular in live theater in the early 20th century. They would... They didn't know each other at the time, but individually of each other, they would attend minstrel shows. They picked up on the rhythm and the dialect that was used in minstrel shows. And if you hear an old Amos and Andy radio show from the 1930s, the dialect that they're using is the same sound of speech that blackface minstrel performers used right. in the 1800s. So they were heavily influenced by it. Um, but what about the attitudes? Where Was it, I mean, because they were white guys. Yeah. Doing something that was, I mean, would it be considered racist at the time? Well, the Amos and Andy show lasted for over 30 years. Stage, radio, and then TV. Yeah, early radio, once radio became mainstream, and then television. And if you look at any show in the history of broadcasting that lasts for 30 years, whether it's The Simpsons or SNL, the first season is very different than the most Mm -hmm. recent season. And the middle seasons are different. So... Amos and Andy was different at different stages in history. When it started in the late 1920s, it was a regional show in Chicago, and they basically were doing a verbatim blackface routine, like straight out of a a joke book, you know, of minstrel routines. Um, Eventually, they- Which was depicting black people as lazy and stupid and- Yeah, but even, even more- um, whittled down than that, like just a two-man act. Like, say, Mr. Bones, who was that lady I saw you with last night? That was no lady. That was my wife. Yeah. You know, the chicken, uh, why did the chicken cross the road was originally a minstrel routine. Uh-huh. The whole idea of, of chicken was part of the chicken stereotype. Yeah. Why did the chicken cross the road? I don't know, Mr. Bones. Why did the chicken cross the road? They get to the other side. Ah, ha, ha. And then they go into another yeah. joke like that. Amos and Andy started to become a scripted show around 1929. And it aired five days a week for 15 minutes a day. And they did something that was incredibly inspired, which led to their popularity. Amos and Andy did not become the most successful comedy show on radio, which it did because people loved minstrel routines so much, but because every episode ended with a cliffhanger. Yeah. And so it was like the same concept as binge watching. What's going to happen next? I got to hear the next one. And so it conditioned people to listen. They actually based it on the popularity of comic strips in newspapers, which uh-huh. did the same thing. Yeah. What's going to happen the next day with Dick Tracy? So that was their first evolution that made them extremely popular. Two white guys playing black guys, and they did all the other characters 15 minutes a day, five days a week. As it became more popular, they were able to attract corporate sponsors were able to, who were able to infuse the show with a great deal of money. And so it expanded to a half hour with a, with a group of writers, with a full orchestra, and it started to take the format of what we now think of as a regular sitcom, sitcom yeah. once a week. They also were receiving criticism from black newspapers like the Pittsburgh Courier, which in 1930 and 31 waged a very aggressive campaign against the show. They said these blackface stereotypes should be forgotten, they should be buried, this show is detrimental, it's harmful. If you agree, clip out this uh, a pre-written re- letter, sign your name to it, and we'll submit it to NBC and to the FCC, at the time called the FRC, Federal Radio Commission. And so there was this enormous letter-writing campaign against Amos and Andy 
Uh, some letter writers comparing them to the Ku Klux Klan, others saying, I love comedy, but this isn't funny. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, they delivered a petition that had close to a million signatures on it to have Amos and Andy removed from the air in the year 1931. Pretty early Which on. It's amazing because how many TVs even existed in 1930? Oh, this was radio. This oh, was this still was radio. radio. Okay. So they were sensitive to that, Charles Carell and Freeman Gosden, who created the show, and to sort of placate the protest, even though it didn't really uh, amount to much, they didn't really, it didn't get removed from the air, it stayed on the air. When they went to the bigger format, the half hour show with the money, they started to hire black actors. They hired an Asian actor. They started to hire other people and they remain the only two white people doing black dialect the weird thing was they started to coach some of the black actors how to speak like black people <laughs> so that wasn't so great yeah that's hilarious <laughs> um but it continued all throughout the 1940s it eventually just became accepted as part of the culture and it actually remained on the air but nowhere near as popular as it had been. Sort of yeah. like The Simpsons today. Yeah. Still on the air, but you don't hear people talking about it right, like you did right, when it started. Right. Yeah. So was that the first time blackface was protested? It wasn't until they... It... No, it was protested by some people in the 1800s, but in terms of a wide-scale campaign against yeah. a broadcast comedy show, that was probably the first major broadcast radio was still relatively new yeah nbc and cbs went network in the late 1920s and this protest began in 30 and 31 because you you because you talk about earlier the irish and italian and yeah. jewish yeah people when they were depicted in in a certain way and this was i guess going back to vaudeville yeah there it, was active protests at theaters all around the country 1890s is when this really began you know there was all this irish immigration italian immigration and jewish immigration when those people had children it was really their 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 american-born children that started to protest what they perceived as slanderous stereotypes mm -hmm. in comedy and they didn't just protest there was a group called the clan Nagale that sabotaged theaters violently this is it, the irish group yeah yeah they were sort of like a I don't think they were connected to the Molly Maguires, but I'm sure they were inspired by that sort of militant, we're going to detonate things until mm -hmm. we get our it's way. That's what we do. That's what we do. <laughs> and so the Clan Nagale, um, they would threaten theaters. They would send letters to Hammerstein's theater saying, you have this Irish stereotype act on the bill. Uh -huh. You should cancel them, remove them. Otherwise, we're going to um, take matters into our own hands. And the mm. theater owner would say, hey, it's just comedy. Relax. Fuck off. We're not changing it. People like it. And then the next thing you know, next performance, stink bombs are being set off in the aisles. People are having to walk out of the theater. People in the audience are blowing whistles to sabotage yeah. the act so the comedian can't be heard. Uh -huh. And the Clan Nagale continued to do that into the 20s when silent movies came along, when they saw... Uh, silent movies that had Irish stereotypes. They would storm the theater and um, throw black paint onto the screen, uh -huh. ruining the movie screen so yeah. nothing could be projected. So these very aggressive protest movements started to occur in the 1890s, throughout the 1910s, started with uh, Irish groups protesting, followed by Italian groups protesting, African-American groups protesting, Jewish groups protesting, and even Native American groups protesting what they perceived as slanderous stereotypes on the stage of, uh, of vaudeville and a lot of the editorial writers of the time would say things like if we buckled to the demands of these irish protesters right. what's next mm -hmm. we're gonna have black people mm -hmm. protesting blackface and then what yeah. there'll be no more comedy so it was sort of not a dissimilar argument to some of the things you hear right but you day. also just think about how tentative uh, an existence it was for immigrants. They, they come in and like, for the Irish, I mean, here we are, we're, we're fleeing a famine mm -hmm. and we're coming over here and we're uneducated. We're seen as the lowest of all European immigrants yeah. and delegated to the worst jobs and clawing for inches of respectability. And then you've got these depictions going out and it's life or death. It's like literally survival mm -hmm. to make sure that you are not held down by these and so you're going to fight and then you think about making fun of like say a wasp mm -hmm. they just you know yeah. shake it off yeah it yeah. doesn't mean anything right but the stakes were very high back then yes because you were slandered throughout the culture you yeah. know you were kept out of you know depending on which group you belong to you're kept out of medical school or law school mm -hmm. or there's restrictions or quotas that 
keep you down. You know, the cliches of the uh, Italian immigrant as an organ grinder comes from the fact that Italians were not allowed to have normal jobs. So they're mm -hmm. basically street vendors selling junk, you know, Irish people as well. But show business was considered completely disreputable. It was like being a prostitute. Yeah, or a drug dealer or uh -huh. a bum. You yeah. know, your pay was, uh, was uh, um, inconsistent. People didn't want to rent to somebody who was an actor. If you were in a bourgeois society, it was shameful if your daughter dated an actor. It hasn't changed very much, I can tell you <laughs> that. I mean, there's definitely like, I mean, think about like the high-end co-ops. Like they don't want entertainers. Yeah, yeah. so for that reason these marginalized groups could gravitate towards show business yeah. and establish themselves there. And there's a reason a lot of people, I think, incorrectly think uh, the reason that Jewish comedians and black comedians have been so dominant throughout history is because comedy comes from pain. Mm -hmm. And I disagree. I think it's because they were kept out of other modes of employment. And so they gravitated towards show business, which was disreputable because you'd be welcome on the stage if you were an Irish immigrant, an Italian immigrant formerly enslaved person and a Jewish immigrant. Well, it also extends to the movie industry, which was started by Jewish people because yeah. they couldn't get their get, get a leg up in other industries yeah. or even Joe Kennedy getting yeah. into the movies. Yeah. Well, and a lot of the people that ran vaudeville theaters then got into movies, you know, mm -hmm. so like RKO, which was a famous movie studio that made the Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers musicals and Citizen Kane and many famous movies in the 30s and 40s, King Kong. RKO st stood for Radio Keith Orpheum, the Keith vaudeville circuit, the Orpheum vaudeville circuit. They merged, and RKO became a film studio. Oh, okay. So and they were Jewish? Yeah. So a lot of these groundings, I mean, eventually Joe Kennedy did run RKO, and he was uh, a total anti-Semite. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. The, the, but the, he also did it in part because— Catholics weren't he, where he was living in Boston at the time. It was the old Brahmins. Yes. And he wasn't afforded the same business opportunities that other people well, were. Well, Catholics were considered demons right. by the predominant Protestant ruling class. And in early America, there are many places where uh, you could not hold political office if you were a Catholic. You couldn't be a judge. You know, so again, the, the Irish Catholic element, if you look, there's such a legacy. If you look throughout the 20th century, who the major comedy stars are almost all of them fall into one of those four categories they're either jewish black irish or italian mm -hmm. almost everybody george yeah. carlin's irish richard Pryor's black obviously uh, there's thousands of prominent jewish comedians and it comes from that uh uh 19th century marginalization shut out of other industries can't get a leg up after immigrating to the united states you find a home on the stage and establish the roots of American stand-up comedy. Don't you think there's something to do with language as well? Like, I really do think of Yiddish. If, Fran if French is the language of love, right. Yiddish truly does have the rhythm it's of hilarious. comedy. It's hilarious. Yeah. yeah. Things land. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Like, before I knew anything about Jewish comedy or Yiddishisms, I was a student of Mad Magazine, uh, and it would be like, yeah, 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 you right. schmuck, <laughs> yeah, you know. Right. And I loved that, and it was funny, yeah. you know. So yeah. yes, there is something to that for sure. And th and that there was so much of a Jewish voice coming from New York, and New York was obviously a very sarcastic and cutting. Well, I mentioned place. I mentioned in the book there were complaints when television began in the late '40s and the early 1950s when people in Ohio and Indiana were seeing television for the first time. And the centrifuge of, of early television was Chicago and New York. And there were letters to the early TV guides complaining about what they called the Lower East Side element on television. <laughs> you know, we're sick and tired of these comedians who uh, are very New York, you yeah. know, quote unquote. Um, and when Milton Berle would do like a Christmas episode, there would be serious complaints. How dare this interloper make right. light of this sacred occasion this right. new york comedian yeah. meaning jewish yeah yeah that's still around that that i think that euf euphemism still stands now i mean i go on the road and i'm telling you when i when i go on and i go um from new york like in the south the hate you. there's there's heckles there's murmurs and then when i say i live in la it's even worse yeah in my first book i talked about or I quoted Harpo Marx talking about how Marx Brothers would be chased out of town. Yeah. You know, they'd be on tour. 
um, he referred to them as the hate towns. Yeah. There were certain stop gaps in the South that they could not get out right. of fast enough. Yeah. Did you read Harpo Speaks? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I just somebody sent me a copy of that recently. It's really great. Um, so um, let's talk about drag because it's very current right now. And we go back to like 1928, I think, in the book when people were dra- it, it, just the swishiness and, yeah. <laughs> you know, dressing in drag and acting gay. And isn't it funny, the staying power yeah. of that? And I, it's not a stereotype. I mean, how do you differentiate between a stereotype and this is how most gay people yeah. talk? You yeah. know, it's effeminate. Yeah. And it's still funny and it's still something guys do with each other. Yeah. And that yeah, acting gay is the first joke in sixth grade. Yeah, well, dudes dressing up as women is like a comedy trope as long as time. You yeah, know, not just vaudeville, but in England where that's even more of a thing. You yeah, know? Um, they had what they called pantos, pantomime. It's got a different meaning in England than it does here. Here we think of pantomime as like a Marcel Marceau, like a mime. But yeah. there, uh, every winter they have what they call a winter panto, which is like a comedy play in which they have what they call a dame, which is a man dressed as a woman, yeah. which I'm sure is what the Barry Humphreys, Dame Edna character is sort of uh-huh. a hat tip to, the idea yeah. of the dame being a man dressed as a woman, usually as homely as possible. You know? Eddie Izzard, or Susie Izzard, yeah. I And you say. see that influence, especially in, I guess, what you could call colonial comedy from Canada, Kids in the Hall, uh, from England, Monty Python, dressing in drag, speaking in a high-pitched voice. But it was a big popular thing to do in the days of vaudeville as well in the 1920s yeah. and one thing that aggravates me by sort of well-meaning people in modern times especially people outside of comedy that talk about comedy because i get interviewed by people who are outside of comedy all the time and it drives me nuts because th- there's cliches on both sides of the political spectrum on the right side it's cancel culture you can't joke about anything anymore on the left side it's punch up punch down punch mm-hmm. up punch down i'm like it's not how comedians talk. Yeah, I don't know right, where these phrases right. came right. from, but I've, nobody's ever had this discussion uh-huh. in the green room. But anyways, there's this argument that there were no women in the past doing comedy or that in the past all comedy was male-dominated, racist, uh, re- regressive. But in 19, 1920s uh, vaudeville, uh, homosexuality was very well accepted. Uh-huh. And it was oh, probably interesting. It was probably one of the one places in America where it was, wow. where it was just accepted. It was like, yeah, of course, you're you're a performer, you're gay, who cares? Uh-huh. You're a great performer. And the same with uh, drag; it was just accepted. And women themselves um, were probably fifty percent of the performers throughout vaudeville's history. It was pretty much evenly evenly split between men and women. Mm. So, contrary to this belief that there were no women before or hardly any women. Some people will say that in an attempt to be progressive and they're actually being regressive by erasing the history of yeah. women, erasing the history of uh, gay people in show business at the time. I guess people just don't know about it. And often when you read the press of the day when it was written about, the press often was um, contemptuous of these sort of homosexual depictions. Mae West wrote a play on Broadway called The Drag. And it was considered in very bad taste, and the mayor of New York wanted it shut down. And because her, of the depiction of gay people, or the yes, fact that it was about all, gay all people? All the characters in the, in the play were uh, homosexuals. Okay. And it was called The Drag. But was it a send-up? Yeah, it was a comedy. It was like a comedy mystery with like a murder mystery yeah. in it, you know. Um, but there were there was a critic, and I quote him in the book, who wrote in Variety in 27, like, this is disgusting, this is appalling, we can't let this stand, people are too afraid to say anything about uh-huh. it, but we allow these, you know, there are all these words like pansies, mm-hmm. lavender was a code word at the time, purple passages, which meant gay material, and said, we can't let this stand, where does it end if we allow this, this immoral, you know, um, depictions or uh, they refer to them as the he-she's. How uh-huh. can we r- allow these he-she's on the stage? Mae West wrote three very um, scandalous plays in the late 20s, which basically made her a star, and that's how she got recruited for the movies. She wrote one called Sex. She w- wrote one called uh, The Drag. And she wrote another called, I think, called The Sinister Age. And they all dealt with what was considered salacious subject matter, open sexuality, open homosexuality, very ahead of her time. 
all of those shows did get raided by the New York City Vice Squad. Oh, no kidding. Some of them had been playing for six months before anybody got arrested, but everybody involved got arrested, not just the performers or the writers, but the theater manager, the ticket seller, the stage manager, anybody is the guy doing the lighting. They were all arrested. Um, specifically, this play Sex was the one that went to trial. She was convicted of obscenity. Mae West spent 10 days in jail as a result of this play called Sex. Wow. And but yet she was she didn't curse. She wasn't she didn't curse. Right. Yeah, by today's standards it would be very very innocuous. Yeah. And then ironically as I mentioned in the book when I get to the the book is written chronologically by the time we get to the 1970s She's I have quotes from Mae right. West complaining. She goes I don't yeah. like to hear dirty words. I don't like dirty jokes being told in my presence. Right. I think Hollywood has gone too far. It's they show too much sex these days. Yeah. And she was considered the she scourge was the of America. She pioneer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Uh I want to talk about uh there's a character Timmy Rogers, not a character, a human yeah. being named yeah. Timmy Rogers and um I think he's sort of like uh bridged a, a time. Timmy Rogers is sort of forgotten, and I didn't include him in my first book, The Comedians. I wish I had, because I misspoke in my first book. I said that Dick Gregory, and this is sort of the common belief, which I believed at the time as well, that Dick Gregory was the first modern black comedian to uh, be booked by white nightclubs and perform for white audiences. And he was one of the first, and he did it at the height of the civil rights movement. But this guy, Timmy Rogers, did it before him, and he was a precursor. Prior to World War II, black comedians, even though they they were allowed on the stage, they were mostly performing as characters in costumes. They weren't really allowed to give their own opinion. Mm -hmm. They certainly couldn't do crowd work. A black comic on stage talking to a white person in the audience, completely taboo. They weren't allowed to. Not allowed. Yeah. You could do that if you were performing for a black audience, mm -hmm. not to a white audience. And white comics were addressing crowds directly at yes, that point. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And white comics could dress in a tuxedo, speak in their own voice. Mm -hmm. Black comedians were expected to conform to a stereotype, do an Amos and, Isles, Amos and Andy style dialect, mm -hmm. wear a floppy hat. They had names like... Uh, pig meat and winehead willy and you know right. they, they didn't use their own names talk about their own experience this changed in the post-war period after world war ii blackface becomes completely taboo it is considered a grave insult to do racist comedy or racial stereotype comedy after world war ii had been waged against sort of racial superiority concepts and bigotry in germany there was probably some sense also that here we've just asked african americans to go put their lives on the exactly. line exactly yeah they return home they're expected to conform to stereotypes yeah. and jim crow what the fuck were we just fighting for overseas yeah. also there was an enormous surge in lynchings in 1946 47 and 48 black men in uniform being murdered because wow. it was considered up at wow. to be a hero as a black person. Jesus. There is a famous story, I forget the guy's last name, Isaac Orson Welles did a radio play about it. A black soldier returning home gets off the bus for the first time after being um, discharged. A white police officer in the South harassed him, gouged his eyes out with a nightstick, and he was blinded for life. It was a, a, a rallying cry for communists and progressive people at the time, and even just regular left-wing people, not mm. communists. Orson Welles wrote a, wrote a play all about this incident. But that was sort of indicative of the type of things that were, were happening in 46, mm -hmm. 47, 48, 49. So show people felt, okay, maybe it's time to Update a ease bit. up on this. Yeah. So Timmy Rogers falls into that vacuum, the post-war period. The comedians who came before him, black comics, were doing stereotypes. Timmy Rogers comes on stage and he's in a tuxedo. His name isn't pig meat or seals uh -huh. or yeah. baby face or whatever. His name is Timmy Rogers. That's his real name. He had a catchphrase. And if you ever talk to Robert Smigel, he'll tell you that his idea for giving Triumph the Insult Comic Dog a catchphrase for me to poop on uh -huh. was inspired by Timmy Rogers, who we saw at the uh, clip of at the Museum of Television and Radio. And Timmy Rogers had this catchphrase after each joke. He'd go, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so if you joke, 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 big laugh, you go, oh yeah! Yeah, yeah, right, right. So he was known as Hey Tim Now. Yeah, exactly. It exactly. was his Hey Now. 
Timmy, oh yeah, Rogers is somehow yeah. how he's billed sometimes. Anyways, he just did normal stand-up comedy, but this was considered uh, revelatory at the time. He did a stand with uh, Sarah Vaughn and I think Duke Ellington's orchestra in 1950 at the Paramount in New York. The Paramount in New York was the presentation house where Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis first became mm -hmm. popular and yeah. famous. And also Frank Sinatra in the story of the Bobby Soxers, same theater. So Timmy Rogers absolutely annihilated this mostly white audience at the Paramount in 1950. And it was considered this defining moment, a new era of black comedy. Where it was okay now. Yeah, and he started to get book, booked at white nightclubs. He did um, a place called the Beverly Hills Country Club in Covington, Kentucky, which later famously burnt down and, and almost everybody in there burned alive. But years earlier, he did it. And he did his thing where he was talking to the audience as a black man, and he did get in trouble. Yeah. Even though he was moving the needle, this place was owned by the mafia, and they said, you can't be talking to the white people in the audience right. like that. You cut that shit out. Right. And you don't wear that suit. You put on a fucking costume like a oh, normal shit. black comic. So he stopped performing there. But that gig at the Paramount in New York was seen by a young comedian who had a TV show on the Dumont Network named Jackie Gleason. Mm -hmm. And Jackie Gleason signed Timmy Rogers to a multi-year contract. And he became a regular on the Jackie Gleason show, one of the few black comedians on TV right. in the 1950s. And he continued to be a nightclub performer all throughout this period. And then the story that I tell in the book, which is a horrible story of what happened to him, 1958, he's popular, he's been on the Jackie Gleason show. Timmy Rogers is hired to perform for the troops overseas, uh, American troops that were stationed in Germany. He's gonna do this, this tour of army bases. He shows up at this gig. He had done three shows that day, and now he's doing the last show of the night at midnight in four different locations. And he shows up, and there's an army officer, a white ar army officer, who is wasted drunk. And he sees Timmy Rogers and says to him, as if he doesn't see him, where's the fucking MC? Where's that fucking MC? You're late, you N-word. Yeah. Yeah. And Timmy Rogers said, are you talking to me? And he goes, you're late. I'll teach you to be late. And he fucking cold cocked him, punched yeah. him in the face, and started kicking him repeatedly yeah. until his ribs were broken, his cheek was broken, he had contusions. He was completely, is that the right word? Contusions? Contusions? Con contusions. Whatever. Whatever the word is. <laughs> he beat the shit out of him and crippled him. He couldn't do the show that night, went to the hospital, an army hospital, and he couldn't move. He could barely uh. move. And so this army officer was court martialed, and they were going to charge him with. Uh, behavior unbecoming of an officer and the rumor mill had it that this guy was going to be discharged from the army right. dis uh, uh, dishonorable discharge and be um, tried for this assault well he denied that he ever did this and after much speculation in the black press it was covered in variety in some of the showbiz periodicals but mostly the white press didn't cover it um, but all the black press did, Chicago Defender, Pittsburgh Courier, Baltimore Afro-American, California Eagle, these were the major black newspapers of the time. They all focused on this story and followed it very closely because Timmy Rogers was considered quite a big yeah, star. Yeah, right. He was acquitted of all charges <sighs> and reinstated Jesus. in his post. Yeah. And Timmy Rogers wasn't able to perform for like uh, almost an entire year until he got back his ability to, to move. Wow. Really, His ribs were broken, his legs. You know, he was also a dancer. And so he could just he couldn't stand up, he couldn't dance. Uh, yeah, it's a horrible story. Um, he Thanks for bringing the podcast yeah, down. To a, Jesus. To a oh, Jesus Christ. But he, he continued to appear on TV, did the Ed Sullivan show. He did go back to the Jackie Gleason show in the 60s. But he did become a very forgotten figure. Yeah. Very seldom do you ever hear the name Timmy Rogers. Yeah. Oh, yeah! Oh, yeah! <laughs> That's like, there's, there was a comic in the 90s. It's a black comic, and his his phrase was "hamburger right, baby." Right, yeah, it's a notorious. Uh, yeah, 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 hamburger baby. Um, and then there was another story I wanted to tell about a guy who um, he got picked up by by police by the police and brought to do a special show. Oh, in the twenties, yeah, yeah. There was this vaudeville comic. I think his name was Corelli, sort of an obscure guy. Um, there's a phrase that's completely forgotten, but that all the old timers that I ever interviewed, and I interviewed like 
not for this book specifically, but my first book, The Comedians, I talked to maybe a hundred dudes, all of whom are dead now, uh-huh. maybe five women, wow. 95 dudes, yeah. who did stand up back in the 30s and 40s and 50s. And there was a phrase in those days called a club date. And a club date specifically meant one nighter. The phrase one nighter didn't exist. Yeah. The phrase was club date. So if a comedian who was 90 told me, yeah, I did a club date, that meant they were doing a one off. Yeah. So this guy Corelli was booked for a club date by the Dallas Police Department. Didn't know what the gig was, but they were going to pay him 100 bucks, which in 1922 is decent money. Yeah. They drive him out of Dallas through the dark, down this highway, through the woods open up the door he gets out there's a cross burning <laughs> in the <laughs> middle his, of field that's his marquee yeah he's yeah. like yeah you're going to you're going to open for the cross burning yeah yeah so he does his stand up act which had nothing no racial component uh-huh. just like oh jeez my mother-in-law is such a pain in the neck <laughs> <laughs> gets his 100 dollars and is driven back uh, to where he came that's from that's amazing yeah. <laughs> how was the gig good good lighting yeah. good lighting um all right, let's cut forward to um, when things start to get um, political in terms of the, the, the right. You talked about the um, moral majority and, and, and how Fred Koch, who was the original, uh, he was David Koch's father. The Co- and Charles Koch. And yeah, Charles Koch brother's father. Koch brother's father, Fred. Uh, I always say cock, but it's Koch, right? It, yeah. Uh, Fred Koch was the co-founder of the John Birch Society. Yeah. The found, founder founder, the main founder was a guy named Robert Welch who was responsible for Junior Mints. Uh so when you eat Junior Mints, remember they are opposed to the civil rights movement. And and sl- tied into the KKK, John Birch and KKK were silent partners basically, right? Well, the John Birch Society always denied it and always distanced themselves from Klansmen and denied that they were anti-Semitic and denied that they were associated with the American Nazi Party. But George Lincoln Rockwell, who was the founder of the American Nazi Party, and by the by, the son of a vaudeville comedian named Doc Rockwell, and uh-huh. he disowned his son when, once he became the leader and founder of the American Nazi Party, he said, George Lincoln Rockwell said, that the John Birch Society members would like to be Nazis, they just don't have the guts. Uh And he said that sometimes our beliefs do bring us together. But they would always deny it. There was another guy who was a co-founder of the John Birch Society named Ravillo P. Oliver, who was a Holocaust denier and extremely anti-Semitic and a weird guy. He had a Hitler mustache. Nice. In the early 60s. Sure. And his name was the same forwards and backwards. Ravillo P. Oliver, Ravillo P. Oliver. Really weird dude. Yeah. But anyways, so they had all these Holocaust deniers and anti-Semites and racists. And one of the things that attracted people to the John Birch Society was their militant opposition to the civil rights movement and Martin Luther King. And one of their arguments was Martin Luther King claims to be nonviolent, but for such a nonviolent man violence seems to follow him wherever he goes yeah and racists love that argument right, they're like right. yeah that makes sense yeah. that seems logic <laughs> yeah it's not us what are you looking at us for yeah um so what was your question though so the founding the so david Koch and his oh, right. involvement in sort right. of like when when politics started to form on the right, right in the way right. it is today. Yeah, so the John Birch Society was funded by major corporations. It was sort of an outgrowth of McCarthyism. John Birch Society is post-McCarthyism, 58. But they um, they were opposed to many of the same things, and they kind of kept the Red Scare going. But they were funded by major corporations like Schick Razor Company. Coors Pe- Beer. Coors Beer came a little bit later, but yes, Paper Mate, Pens, Campbell's Soup, they were all on board, and they would fund um, the John Birch Society. Coors came a little bit later, although the Coors Company, when you got your paycheck at the plant in Colorado, they would uh, slip John Birch Society pamphlets into the envelope Uh, with your paycheck, uh and they would pressure people to vote for their uh, preferred candidates, and they would insert pamphlets that would say, you know, civil rights movement is a communist conspiracy yeah. conspiracy that's going to lead to tyranny. And like I said earlier, George Carlin, Bob Dylan, Mad Magazine, Johnny Carson, they all ridiculed the John Birch Society. Nobody took them seriously. And this guy, Paul Weyrich, who I mentioned earlier, who was a lecturer on the John Birch Society circuit and a very controversial one, 
because he would go and speak to Republican clubs and complain about Republicans, saying they're not real Republicans. They're really just liberals. This Republican su supports the civil rights movement, uh -huh. and this Republican does that. And Republican societies would complain. They would say, why are you sending us these extremist speakers who are calling Eisenhower a communist stooge? Like this is So they never gained mainstream traction, even though they were mainstream famous. They were largely derided and ridiculed. This guy, Paul Weyrich, understood that because he was a smart political strategist that his philosophy would never gain traction in america uh being associated with the john birch society so he repackaged the ideas in 1973 with funding from coors they founded the heritage foundation mm -hmm. which is still a famous think tank to this day you'll see their representatives on tv in editorials talk radio and they never really explain what it is. It'll be a guy in a bow tie talking uh, about the founding fathers. Yeah. And I'll say, so-and-so is a senior fellow at the Heritage Foundation. Uh-huh. What the fuck is a senior <laughs> fellow? A senior... <laughs> yeah. What the fuck is this foundation? Who founded it? Who's behind it? What is their concept? Yeah. Well, Paul Weyrich took those uh, derided and ridiculed John Birch Society theories and philosophies and repackaged them in a sort of scholarly veneer, and that was the Heritage Foundation. So it was a little bit less crass. It was based on uh, uh, supposedly studies. Mm -hmm. Black people are inferior. Here's this proof, right. this evidence. Here's right. a guy with glasses and a bow tie mm -hmm. who, uh, who is going to uh, make that argument in a way that makes it seem like it's coming from some Institute of Higher Learning. Yeah. When it's not, it's coming from the John Birch Society. Essentially. It is amazing to this day when you think about certain people like uh, who's the Canadian professor guy that Peterson? Uh, yeah, Jordan Peterson. Like people that are eloquent and confident and dress the right way, you just believe them. Yeah. You know, no matter how much horse shit they're spewing, <laughs> you go like, all right, I got to uh, This guy's smarter than me. I guess I might as well take his ideas. See, I'm Canadian. So when somebody has a thick Canadian accent, I don't trust a word they fucking yeah. say. <laughs> well, you know, the, the thing is, the yeah. left is very into woke ideology. I'm like, why yeah. are you talking like that? Right, right, right. Talk normally. I'm yeah. from Canada. I don't talk like that. Come right. On. So going back to the Coke. So, the, so this idea of now taking... Major funding, which just grows exponentially yeah. as the decades wear on, and taking that money and putting it into think tanks who are really furthering corporate interests. I exactly. mean, they are brainwashing the status quo to help cut down on taxes for the wealthy, break down unions. Yeah. 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 I mean, how do you get the public to support things that are uh, opposed to their best interests? Yeah. You have to create a vehicle of propaganda in order to convince people. And corporations do not fund things generally for altruistic reasons. Mm -hmm. Even before the Heritage Foundation and right-wing think tanks, in the pre- and post-war era, there were left-wing think tanks, but they also weren't really doing things for altruistic reasons. There was the Ford Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Carnegie Foundation, you know their names from PBS sponsorships. They were doing that for PR reasons. Ford was associated with Adolf Hitler yeah. and anti-Semitism. So in the post-war period, when Henry Ford died, the Ford company made the Ford Foundation a vehicle for liberal causes, and they would donate you know, to black Just to whitewash his past. Yeah, exactly. It was totally a PR move. Um, and that was true of a lot of television sponsorship, too, like the American Gas Association, U.S. Steel. They had a lot of bad PR due to a variety of business scandals. So they would sponsor cultural programming, the opera or classical music, and, and try and use that as a selling point of, look at what great public benefactors we are. So, well, look at the Sticklers. They did it more, more recently. The, the, um, f the Purdue family that gave us uh, all the opiates. Right, right. They had their names on every university, every right. library. Plus, you get to write that off. Right. You know? So either that money's going to get taxed, or you can get some... Uh, uh, ego gratification by getting your name on the institution. Right. You get a tax break from it. Um, but in the in the seventies, Heritage Foundation onward, mostly the think tanks have been these sort of uh, corporate vehicles of propaganda. Uh, a lot of the language that we hear repeated in the media with fiscal cliff, fiscal cliff. Do you remember that one in two thousand twelve? Yeah, right. Acorn, acorn, acorn. They're these sort of 
rallying cries that get beaten over and over and over yeah. until people are hysterical about them. Yeah. Death panels, death panels, right. death panels. None of it ever bodes into reality. Uh-huh. It gets replaced with another And a lot of this cry. verbiage is written by the think tanks and then like Rush Limbaugh you talked about was the first one to actually get the script delivered to him and start reading it word for word. Yeah, they, they had a deal. Premier On Call, which was the company, or Premier Media was the group associated with the Rush Limbaugh show in the late 80s, early 90s. The Heritage Foundation paid them a million dollars a year to integrate their talking points into his commentary as if it were coming off the top of his head. Mm-hmm. And that's been common throughout uh, recent history, the 80s, the 90s, and now. Um, and that's a very effective method, you know. Um, Premier On Call also hired, and this is sourced, you know, I don't want people to think that this... No, and then repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. We started that. Um, they had casting calls for phone callers, fake phone callers to phone in and agree with the host. Uh-huh. Um, and they would, you know, have a contract with Rush Limbaugh or any m- number of shows for this. So there was an incredible amount of deceit to try and push certain things and to kind of push public opinion in a certain direction because otherwise nobody is going to say yes i want to pay a lot for health care exactly. you know yeah. no, no rational person thinks like i want to pay more for everything i want schools to be worse yeah <laughs> well i mean that's a very big idea that you bring up is you know there is a vested interest in these corporations to dumb america down and make it that much easier to scare them into voting a certain way and not fact yeah. check. And, and, and repetition is so effective, yeah. you know, and we're all susceptible to it. I'm susceptible. That It's not like I'm not saying that it's just like a stupid people that are susceptible to propaganda. All of us are susceptible to propaganda if it's delivered with the illusion that it's real and if it's repeated often enough. And if that repetition is coming from enough uh, what seem to be different sources. Mm-hmm. But what a lot of the think tanks do and what the Koch brothers have done traditionally is they'll fund a hundred different media outlets and they will all say the same thing. Mm-hmm. So it makes it feel like, oh, all these people are in agreement. You don't realize it's coming from the same 10 sources of funding, right. whether it's the Wilkes brothers, Robert and Rebecca Mercer, uh, uh, Sheldon Adelson, the Koch brothers, the DeVos family, well, and then Skate the, Foundation. And then also the uh, the TV network, the... Um uh, they own a lot of the local affiliates, and they oh, do Sinclair the new, Broadcast. Yeah, Sinclair Broadcasting. Yeah, I mean, yeah. they they those broadcasters have been shown videos of them reading the same exact right, right. famous video. op-ed yeah. pieces. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you wouldn't think it would be so effective, but it's extremely effective, yeah. and it's more effective now because social media is sort of based on repetition. Mm-hmm. And one of the arguments I make in the book. You know, people feel that everybody is too sensitive these days or more sensitive these days, that people didn't complain in the past. They only complain now. But the reality is that in the past, you would read horrible news in the newspaper and then you, that was it. You would throw it away. Yeah. You didn't keep rereading the newspaper all day long yeah. at a stoplight when you're waiting in line, you know. Right. But now we look at our phone and we scroll through the same shit over and over and over. It has this sort of insidious effect that... Yes, things are horrible, no denying that. But imagine if you had an iPhone in 1939 mm-hmm. and we're scrolling through Twitter. Oh my God, Germany. Oh my God, yeah. Soviet Union. Oh, Jim Crow. Good Lord, what is the world coming yeah. to? Um, so that repetition effect is really, really effective. And mm-hmm. I think it really distorts people's uh, perspectives and yeah. perceptions. All right, let's jump forward to, um, the, uh, to George Carlin and Frank Zappa. You're talking about now, like the '70s, and mm-hmm. um, there Zappa was a guy that you know when Tipper Gore comes along, mm-hmm. and uh, the group that what was her group? The PMRC. The, the PMRC. Parents, Parents Music Resource Council. So that became the new way of, and this is amazing because, like you know, Al Gore we think of today as such a you know he, yeah, he's a Democrat. progressive, yeah. and and his wife was like really like the behind all the censorship that mm-hmm. was happening back then. And some of the quotes you read from Zappa, and I mean, we've all seen clips of him debating people. He could fucking take people apart. Yeah, very smart. Yeah. So um, I'm just curious, like, what what effect do you think Zappa had on this this war of censorship that was going on at that time? Frank Zappa, I have so much uh, respect for, you know. He sort of um, 
he's just saw through the bullshit. You know, that's the problem with party politics is that you have to believe things that you probably don't believe. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're a Democrat, you have to pretend that Joe Biden's a great speaker. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're a Republican, you're pretending that Donald Trump's a great Christian. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're a libertarian, you got to pr- pretend that corporations will never do anything that is uh, bad or evil or criminal. And you that know? Bill Maher's funny. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anybody's pretending that, but uh, you know what I mean? So there's a dogma that is sort of like, it's similar to religion. It's also similar to sports, you know, where your team is good, but the other team plays dirty. Yeah, it's and nationalism. Yeah, and you're blind to the, the, the things that your guys are doing. Frank Zappa saw through all of that. You know, he he said he called out Tipper Gore. Yeah, she's Al Gore's wife. She's a Democrat. She's also full of shit. You know, she there's a pretty funny uh, quote from her in the book where she's talking about how um, uh, Pink Floyd's The Wall was responsible for a murder, and she's describing it. She's saying this the, the the terrible story of this young teenager who was listening all night long to Pink Floyd's The Wall on repeat. Then he went out into the living room and the babysitter was watching a violent episode of Starsky and Hutch. Yeah. And then he stabbed her to death. Uh-huh. And I'm like, that sounds like a Jerry Falwell or Pat yeah, Robertson yeah. style story, but it's coming from Tipper Gore. Um, yeah, I, the evangelical influence in the 80s, and I think I see it happening today as well, it's very effective of, at manipulating people who are not religious, not evangelicals, as long as it's concealed, as long as it's not a preacher saying it. If it's right. a guy in a suit, people are like, yes, drag queens are trying to recruit our children. You'll see right. people falling for these things, but their source is uh, of an evangelical root. So the PMRC, which was headed by Tipper Gore, was fed all kinds of material from groups like Focus on the Family, James Dobson, um, and several others. And there was also the satanic panic, they call it, of the 1980s, where people were convinced that children were falling into Satanism. They're listening uh-huh. to Ozzy yeah, Osbourne. They're playing Dungeons and Dragons. Now they're sacrificing goats or whatever. Yeah, you know? I remember in Long Island, kids were leading other kids into the woods to sacrifice them. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It was all uh, total nonsense. But people that should know better would fall for it. But anyways, Tipper Gore does come across as a villain in the book. And Frank Zappa was one of the few people to, to point out that all of this material that you're complaining about, saying that Cindy Lauper is causing trouble in the home, that Twisted Sister, they really hated that song of Twisted Sister, that famous music video. Uh, We're not going to take it? Yeah, yeah. They're like, it's fostering disorder for the, in, the, yeah. in the family, in the home. People are right. rebelling against their parents. Frank Zappa saw through all of that and and showed, you know, and demonstrated. He goes, a lot of this is like evangelical hogwash. These are mm-hmm. people that used to be associated with the John Birch Society. A lot of these people are bigots. Right. And you're going to believe them that rock music is more responsible for the problems in America than corruption, than, right. you know, any number of other things. Right. When you have, um, when you have, uh, what's his name? Who was the uh, Charlton Heston speaking out against this stuff? And meanwhile, he's a spokesman for the NRA. Right. It's like, I, which I, did more damage? Right. In this that's Ice T's argument. I quote him in the book saying the exact same thing like, cop killer kills more people, the song, or the actual armaments. Um, yeah, that was another huge hysteria at the time. The 90s, it didn't subside. There was hysteria over the Simpsons. There's, it's fostering disrespect, and it's obscene. He's saying, don't have a cow. That's obscene. The, yeah. word, the word sucks came yeah. into common usage then, and that was considered like uh, indicative of, of, of downfall of America, right. like an obscenity. Well, what does the word sucks mean? What do you think that means? That's disgusting. Yeah, yeah, you know right. saying? Suck what? What yeah. are they <laughs> sucking? Well, and then Beavis and Butthead of being just... Just the idea that it's glorifying being a cut up in school. Yeah, yeah, and also um, uh, Beavis's uh, catchphrase was "fire, fire, yeah, fire." Yeah. You know, it was sought seemed to encourage arson. There was one case um, turned out to be false years later, but at the time it was treated as true by the news that a kid had watched Beavis and Butthead, heard Beavis yell "fire, fire, fire," and then torched his home, and his daughter died. Turns out, yes, there was a fire. Yes, his sister did tragically die. The kid had never seen Beavis and Butthead. His mom blamed Beavis and Butthead. She was afraid that she would be held responsible. And that came out years later. When he, this kid, he goes, we're so poor, we didn't have cable. That's right. We couldn't that's have right. seen it. Yeah. 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 Right, yeah. right. Uh, supposedly, his mother was a, a drug user who, you know, uh, I don't know if it was meth or crack, but she 
was worried that it was her who started the fire. Yeah. So she came up with this theory. Well, and the other height of hypocrisy, of course, is uh, our good friend Bill Cosby, who was the most vocal guy against cursing, against anything that was against family values. Yeah, and, and he hated The Simpsons. When The Simpsons first debuted for a full season and it was put up against The Cosby Show, Bill Cosby said, I welcome the, the competition, because he was number one in the ratings at the time. He goes, I welcome the competition. Six months later, he fell to number two and starts going around saying, it's a bad example for children, <laughs> yeah, you know? Right. Um, and it's so funny because these controversies occur and people care about them so much at the time. We got to suppress it, the example. Mm -hmm. Two years later, The Simpsons is in syndication at 4 p.m. Nobody it's cares. It's almost seen as like fuzzy Americana now. Yeah, exactly. And this happens yeah. time and time again. The, El the Elvis hysteria, the Beatles uh -huh. hysteria. You go into any fucking Walmart, you're hearing these songs as music. Our kids think that jazz is old fogey music now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All of these things. So when people get hysterical about comedy, about show business, about jokes, all of these hysterias subside. You know, I do understand why some people might be upset about some things sometimes. I even understand how uh, a parent might be disturbed by sexuality as it started to, things became freer in the early 70s mm -hmm. i understand it yeah um but all of that hysteria is fleeting mm -hmm. it never ever endures and almost always in subsequent decades looking back at it it looks ridiculous mm -hmm. it looks hilarious and the things that people were upset about appear to be very very quaint and i yeah. think that will be true again in the future uh, regarding things that people are hysterical about right now. I can remember Dice back in, I guess Dice was in the late 80s and 90s when he hit his his peak. I remember, like, I'm a stand-up comic. I was all about free speech. I was offended by Dice. I thought a lot of the things that he was saying, like, but I never gave up, like, my belief that he had a right to say them. And, right. But I remember, and you talk about this in the book, but, like, it was his fans that I said to myself, this guy can't really defend himself as saying this is a character because his fans are chanting with closed fists like fascists, and this guy is playing into that. See, I think Dice made a mistake by never making a clearer line between a character and reality. Yeah. Because whenever he was interviewed, it was always in character. Yeah. So for some of those fans, to him, he wasn't a character. Uh -huh. I mean, obviously he's a character. He's yeah. this ridicu ridiculous persona. But I feel like a lot of that fan base didn't understand that. No. You know? And so in a way, he's it's his fault for making that line so blurry. You know? No, that's what I love about Bill Burr is he, do he does these rants that are, you know, not, not very politically uh, astute. Or I'd say, I would say, uh, you know, uh, uh, sensitive or aware. But then he'll stop and he'll go, you guys know I don't believe half this shit, right? Yeah. Well, Bill Burr, you know that. I think, it, you know, he's such a master. You know, for me, great comedy, like great philosophy, it's about clarity. Yeah. You know? And if something's lost in translation between the moment it leaves your mouth and arrives at the audience, you have to tweak it so that that yeah. clarity is there. Right. The thing I love about Bill Burr, and I think the reason that some stupid people may not like Bill Burr. I don't meet too many, but I know when he did SNL, there was some people complained about his monologue. Some people tune out during the setup because Bill, yeah, right. Bill will do like an intentionally provocative right. or reactionary setup, and then he hits this like super progressive punchline. Yeah. And if you stay with the whole joke, it's, you know, right. it's brilliant. Right. You know, like his bit about Black History Month is a good example of that. But if you are unwilling to have the patience to listen to the full joke, yeah, you might walk away thinking this guy is a, a lunatic asshole when it's clear. No, I think this. I think that kind of joke recipe has was started with Louis C.K. I mean, in terms of like right up front, here's an indefensible premise. Right, right, right. And now <laughs> I'm going to walk you through it, and at the yeah. end, you're going to go, "All right, yeah, I got you." Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, but I mean, that's what great comedy is. It's just the old fashioned bait and switch the element of surprise mm -hmm. we think it's going one way and goes the other yeah bill burr will always be my favorite i think it's really just, yeah i just nobody makes me laugh harder he's the best he's re he's really great i think louis ck is probably my favorite yeah over over the course of uh time there's just certain people gilbert god mm -hmm. rest his soul norm god rest his soul mm -hmm. bill burr there's certain people that just I cannot control myself. Yeah. Just laughing right. at every fucking little thing. Right. And all three of those guys in particular, 
they figured out a, a formula, which is hard for, especially when you're new to comedy or a younger comedian, how to make your persona on stage and off stage almost the same in the sense that you're just as funny in an interview as you are in your act, as you are on panel, you know. Right. Uh, Norm and Bill Burr on a talk show panel. I mean, it's like must-see TV every yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, right, right. All right, listen, speaking of must-see, uh, don't don't forget to pick up Outrageous, the new book by Cliff Nesteroff. It is available everywhere. How It's been out for what, like a month? No, it hasn't come out yet. No. Oh, get out of here. That's the advanced copy. November oh. 28th, by the time most people hear this, it'll probably be out. November 28th. Okay. It'll be available in hardcover and in audiobook. It form. is a great read, and uh, you're just a very talented guy who clearly is very passionate about what you're writing about and it comes through and thank you and yeah. just to just to clarify so there's no misunderstanding it's not a book of woke bullshit it's a book of woke bullshit balanced with reactionary bullshit no there's moments where i stop and go yeah i kind of do agree with the right on this one you know like it, you you definitely don't you 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 have very careful not to pick a side yes, i wanted to I think present so present the opinions of both sides in every way. There's a chapter in there about Eddie Murphy, uh, Sam Kinison, and Dice Clay together. And it's about the protest that they generated at the height of their fame, which yeah. is not dissimilar to some of the, the protests that Dave Chappelle was receiving in recent history. Right. And that a- analogy is not explicit, but it should be sort of assumed as you read it. You know, hey, that's like today. But I try and keep my own opinion out of this as much as possible, but present the opinion of supporters and detractors. Yeah. You know, and right. then you can come to your own conclusions. Right. Okay. Thanks, brother. Thank you. Okay. Uh-